Welcome back to the Home Lab and today we're going to look at the Crooks Radiometer, a device that looks so simple and yet is incredibly difficult to explain. So it's a lovely sunny day in the home lab today and the little Crooks radiometer I've got uh, was spinning around like mad on the windowsill over there. So I've brought it onto the bench and what we're going to do today is discuss how this thing works and particularly the fact that the explanations that are on the internet, at least most of them, are completely wrong. So this device is named after Sir William Crookes, who in around the 1860s, 1870s, was doing some very, very sensitive chemical analyses. And what he had to do was he had to weigh his chemicals uh, with a very, very fine balance. And he was getting annoyed by the air currents that were affecting the readings on the balance. So what he did was he put the chemicals and the weighing device in a reasonably good vacuum. It wouldn't have been a perfect vacuum. But what was really strange was, when you watched the readings on the balance, they still changed and they seemed to change whether it was sunnier or darker in the laboratory. So in about the 1870s, mid 1870s, he investigated that a bit further and came up with this wonderful piece of apparatus that now is really just a physics toy, which we know as the Crookes radiometer. So, if you've not come across these devices before, um, have a look on the internet. You can buy them as physics uh, curios, as toys these days. They're not that expensive and um, they're well worth having in your house. In fact, you might notice I've just lifted this up off the uh, darker area by the desk uh, into the sunlight and it's now spinning much, much faster. Um, this one, in fact, uh, I bought from China and it arrived broken, snapped off here, but I just glued it and it's now working perfectly. So, uh, what's inside a Crookes radiometer? Well, if you remember back to his experiment, um, he had an evacuated area in which he was weighing the chemicals. So what we've got here is a reasonably good vacuum, but it's important to know that it's not a perfect vacuum. There is some gas in here. And what we've also got freely rotating are some veins. And um, there are usually four of them, and they're usually uh, sort of square in shape, though there, there could be more, um, there could be slightly less, it doesn't matter. What's important is two things about the veins. Firstly, one side is really shiny, and the other side is matte black. And secondly, that the vein material is not a particularly good conductor of heat. And quite often it's mica, which is a very, very thin rock that's used for the veins, both because um, it's got a very low thermal conductivity and also because it can be made very thin and very light to manufacture the veins. So you can see this whizzing around. Let's have a go at some of the explanations and I'll show you why most of the explanations that are posted on the internet are completely wrong. So let's have a look at the first explanation as to why this rotates and uh, it's a bit of a spoiler. This is what most people thought and it's incorrect. But let's go through it anyway because it's a common explanation of this device. So the first thing that people notice is that when lots of sunlight hits it, it rotates very rapidly and when it's in a slightly darker area with a lower intensity of light, it doesn't rotate as fast as it was. So um, the explanation seems to be that light is hitting this and if light's hitting it, light's probably a particle, a photon, and therefore the photons are driving these veins around. Well, let's have a quick think about that. Photons do indeed have momentum. And if they have momentum and they transfer that momentum to something they hit, then there's a force. And if there's a force, that force will cause the veins to rotate. Well, so far, so good. 
Um, that seems to fit with all the observations that we make. But we need to know a little bit more about how this change in momentum happens. So I've got my little mock-up of the veins here, a shiny side and a dark side. OK, and that's what it will look like when it's rotating if you had uh, two veins in the system. So the momentum argument is flawed partly for this reason. There are two reasons why it's flawed. Firstly, uh, you get the biggest change in momentum when a particle goes in, hits a surface, stops and then is forced back out. In other words, the momentum goes from a value to zero to minus that value. And it's a thing that students find difficult. Um, there is a change in momentum of 2 mv. So let's have a look at it. Well, if the light is absorbed by the black surface, then it will go in and via what I've suggested, it will stop because it's absorbed and lose momentum, mv, and create a force. Fair enough, okay. But what about the shiny side? Well, if it was to reflect off the shiny side or bounce off, if you remember what I've just said, it'll come in with mv, momentum. It will go out with minus mv, because momentum's a vector quantity. So it will have a change in momentum of 2 mv, and therefore the force on the silver side will be twice as large, and therefore the silver side will be pushed round preferentially to the black side. And that is not what you see. What you see is the silver sides coming towards you and the black sides going away from you. So we've debunked the photon pressure model. There is indeed a photon pressure on the veins and it is measurable. It's absolutely minute and you need a slightly better type of radiometer, not this type. Oh look, it's just stopped, so um, it's obviously got a little bit darker around here. Um, this one's got rather a lot of friction in it, so it doesn't seem to like rotating in a sort of normal light levels. But as soon as the sun shines on it, it gets going well. But what you notice was that it's the uh, black sides that go away from you, not the shiny silver sides. OK, so let's look at the second explanation that's commonly given for how this thing actually works. Well, if you remember, there isn't a vacuum in here. There's a low pressure gas and getting this to work. It's a fine balance between completely evacuating it where it doesn't work and putting too much gas in where it also doesn't work. So you need a very low pressure gas for this to work. And we know that the temperature of a gas is indicative of, of its kinetic energy. So the hotter a gas is, the more kinetic energy the particles have got on average. So um, the idea goes something like this, that the black surface absorbs heat better from the light imparting on it. That's true and that the shiny surface reflects any of that heat that comes in. So the black surface is hotter. Now, if you can imagine a gas particle coming in slowly, hitting the black surface, it will warm up. It will gain thermal energy. And if it gains thermal energy, its kinetic energy goes up. So it'll come off the black side faster. And if it comes off faster with more momentum coming towards you in this direction, there must be an equal and opposite effect backwards. And therefore, correctly, the black vein will be pushed away from you. So that sounds pretty good to me. Billions of gas particles here, all touching the black vein, gaining momentum from the heat in the vein, coming off faster and imparting a force on the vein that causes it to rotate away from you. But unfortunately, there's a problem with this explanation as well. So I'll quickly try and explain why uh, this explanation is flawed as well. It is correct to say that the black side will absorb energy better and will get hotter. It's also correct to say that a gas particle hitting this may well gain thermal energy and will come off faster. But think about what these fast moving particles coming off the black vein are doing to those that are trying to get in. What they'll do is collide with them and make them less effective at making their way to the black vein. Therefore, the um, situation there sort of counterbalances or balances out. In other words, we expect gas particles to come off faster, 
but the trouble is they block the ones coming in. Now I know that's not a brilliant explanation, but I hope you get the idea that this way of explaining the reason why the black vein moves away from you also has its problems in physics. So we need a third explanation. So the third explanation was proposed by Osborne Reynolds, an absolute genius of physics. And some of you might recognize his name from uh, fluid dynamics and the Reynolds number and things like that. I remember uh, studying in the Reynolds building uh, when I did my undergrad uh, at UMIS, Manchester University, and he spent his whole career there. I perhaps wasn't switched on enough to realize just how amazing it was to work in a building that was named after this great scientist. But um, I digress. So let's look at the explanation that Reynolds came up with. And I won't go into detail about how he got to this explanation. I'll just go straight to it. And it's not an easy one. So we're back to our two veins. The black one will absorb heat better. Um, so around it, um, any particle coming in and touching the plate will gain heat energy. But here's the cunning bit. I suggested that if they hit the surface and come back out again, the overall effect is negligible because they're stopping other gas particles coming in. But what about those that are right at the edge here? They stand a chance of gaining energy and having a grazing blow with the edge of the black plate. And if they have a grazing blow, they'll impart momentum to it, but they'll sort of carry on in the same direction as the black plate. Now this can only happen at the edges, and this process is called thermal transpiration. So I've done my best there to explain how the Crookes radiometer works, and mine's sort of almost slowed down in the uh, darker room now. The sunlight seems to have gone a bit cloudy today. Um, it's not an easy explanation, uh, but the one that's currently believed to be true is the one suggested by Reynolds, the thermal transpiration. So just to recap, remember that it's gas particles not hitting and bouncing back, but having uh, a grazing blow, um, having gained thermal energy, having increased their speed, having a grazing blow with the edge of the black surface, which is warmer due to the fact it absorbs heat energy better than the shiny silver surface. Of course, you could imagine that if both surfaces were black, this thing wouldn't rotate at all. Just before we finish, you'll notice that my radiometer has stopped turning, which is just what you don't want when you try to teach these things. But just to prove that it is using thermal energy, I'm just going to put my hands on it and warm the outside of the glass a little bit. And then if I remove my hands, see what happens. Well, there we go. It's got going again. So I do hope you enjoyed that video and I didn't confuse you too much and I really didn't want to get too mathematical. But I just wanted to make it clear that sometimes explanations in physics seem so obvious and yet what's actually going on is much more complex and unusual. Why not get one of these? Um, they're lovely things to have in the house. Uh, just put it somewhere where it won't break, so probably high up, but somewhere in the window where it'll get rather more light than mine is at the moment. I'll be making another video soon on the Crookes radiometer, but what I'm going to do there is I'm going to cool it down. And I wonder if you can think what would happen if I cool the outside of the radiometer. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that and I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.